Hi. Welcome back from the coffee break. We have three more talks. Um, and the next one is going to be by Josh. He lives in New York. He is not from there, as you'll quickly tell from his voice. Um, he works at Bloomberg, and he's going to talk about the Bloomberg app and React Native. So here's Josh. Great. Uh, so that's me on the screen. Um, hey, everyone. Uh, as Brent kindly mentioned, my name is Josh. Um, I work on the Bloomberg News app. And uh, it's essentially an app where you can view different, so like, uh, different news coming from Bloomberg, written by G Bloomberg journalists. Um, I'm based out of New York, which is Bloomberg's main, uh, main office. Um, and we also have another, the, the European office is based out of London, and we have a few other offices around the world for engineers. Um, and I'm really passionate about cross-platform app development. I think it's really compelling for... Uh, say, us developers to be able to do more with less code, and we can have a greater impact with the work we do, which is amazing. So what is Bloomberg, for everyone that doesn't know? So it's a tech company with 19,000 employees. Um, we have around uh, 5,000 software engineers who work on the Bloomberg terminal. And the Bloomberg terminal is up there on the screen, uh, sorry, in the image. And it's essentially a desktop application which, if you're a financial trader or involved in the financial markets in any way, you might use this to, to further or, or make better decisions about the markets. Um, and essentially, the whole UI is written with JavaScript. So out of those 5,000 engineers, around 2,000, uh, we have around 2,000 engineers who work primarily on JavaScript. So as a company, we're, we really love it. Um, and we have millions and millions of lines of JavaScript code. Uh, a rough estimate is that there is greater than 100 million lines of, of JavaScript that we have checked into repositories uh, throughout the company. Um, and as well as being a sort of tech company, it's also a media company with television. You may have seen it in your hotels or on TV. We have a radio station. We have magazines uh, that you may see in airports, like Bloomberg Business Week. And we also have mobile, which is what I work on. We also have the web. Um, and the uh, people producing that content that we display um, is the 2,700 journalists and analysts we have in 120 countries around the world. So this is the Bloomberg website, which is what, what you get if you go to Bloomberg.com. And this is the app that I work on. So uh, it's all React Native, which is, which is awesome. Uh, and essentially here, we're just seeing a few different screens without the, throughout the app. So we have the, the news feed itself, uh, which is just a collection of the, the stories for, for your particular region. Um, we have market data. We have what we call the watch list. So essentially, you can track different stocks uh, in your portfolio, and you can see how uh, your, overall, your portfolio is, uh, is doing overall. And then we have live TV, video on demand, uh, audio on demand, and live radio as well. So what you see here is just a, a screen capture from, uh, from just a live, a live video feed. So how did we end up with the React Native app? Um, Essentially, uh, back in 2016, around React Native version 0.16, um, we essentially decided that what we would try and do is replace the, the feed in our native app. So at the time, we had an iOS, iOS app and an Android app. And what we did was we took that, uh, we essentially lifted the feed out, the native feed, and put the React Native feed in. And so we released that in about April 2016. And the results we saw were really encouraging. We as developers and the team felt that this was a good direction. So when our design team came to us and they asked us, you know, hey, we want to do this, this new redesign, uh, sort of like a visual redesign as well as some new screens, we took that opportunity to say, hey, you know what, rather than uh, doing this natively, let's try and do it with a React Native app, uh, a full you know, React Native in it, 
React Native app, and that's essentially what we did. We kind of got our head down, heads down for like three, four months and worked on a rewrite in React Native, and then we released that in December 2016. And so the image you see on the left, that's the first uh, the React Native feed within the native app. And then the version on the right, which is kind of a, an early version of our React Native app, which you can now see has kind of looks better because of iterative design. Um, but that, that app on the app is the, the first release that on Android we had for the React Native app. And so I'm just going to do a quick demo here um, so you can kind of get a feel for, for the app itself. And so what we have, we have our app. Now this is if you are viewing an article. You can go down, you can see there's different graphics. Uh, we can then go down to this feature which we have called the bulletin. And the bulletin is actually really cool. Um, it uh, essentially uh, uses machine learning to auto-summarize stories into short snippets. And you can keep on refreshing as a user and view these different stories. And then we can go over to our markets tab. And here we can see some market news and with some different tabs at the top. So we have indices. And uh, so we can tap on a particular index, say the S&P 500. We can, look at, um, we can look at essentially performance over time. So one year, five year, year to date. And you can see that graph there as well. And then we have some news relating to the S&P 500. And then you can see the most active stocks that have changed the most during the day. And so we can go and take a look at Bank of America. And you can see similar kind of information. Um, and the cool kind of thing about this is that everything here is written with React Native. Um, here we just see some more, so some stats about Bank of America. And then we go to the watch list, which is where you can track your stocks. Uh, you can input your portfolio. Um, and then we can head over to the media tab, which is where we have the live, live video, live audio. Um, and uh, we're just going to tab back to video and then watch the live feed, which would be live if you downloaded the app off the App Store, which you can do. Uh, and display, it will pull in the live TV uh, from, from the current live stream. Uh, so either from London, Singapore, New York. Um, and then we can then minimize with uh, what we call the, I guess it's called player and player. So you can essentially navigate throughout the app um, while the, this video is playing. Uh, so that's just a brief overview of the app. And how does that translate to code base uh, breakdown? And so we have 86.4% JavaScript. Uh, we have a bit more Objective-C than we have Java, but we have 6.6% Objective-C and 5.2% Java. And then have a small amount of Swift, um, and then just some scripting stuff uh, for CI and stuff like that. So with using this much JavaScript, where do we, or where do we as a, t kind of as a team feel we get a lot of benefit? And one of these cases we do feel we get a lot of benefit is from from articles themselves. So articles, um, as you can see, there's, there's kind of a lot going on. You can have embedded images, paragraphs, lists, uh, different graphics. Um, and so this is like a fairly complex component to style. So uh, essentially, these, these elements in our articles can be composed in, in, in any order. They can be nested in different ways, uh, nested within each other. And with this component, for example, we can share all of the, the service layer, all of the styling, and all of the render logic. And I can't really understate how valuable this is and has been for our team to not have to maintain this on two different platforms. Um, and so essentially, it significantly reduces the maintenance burden that we have as a team. Um, and these efficiency savings like translate to implementing design systems as a whole, too. So, you can see that we have, a, a, I guess, a design effort across mobile and web where we're trying to have a kind of cohesive experience on both mobile and web, where we implement the whole app to, to kind of have the similar look and feel on mobile as it does web. And on mobile, at least, we can share all of, the, all of these kind of navigation components if we made any custom ones. Um, and it's actually just a, it's just, just a big win. Uh, and this, these savings also apply when you're making more complex components too. So this is our, 
uh, kind of market overview uh, or, or, or indices overview. And what we have here is we have a fairly complex component again. And um, there's, there's a lot going on here. Styling-wise, there's a lot going on here in terms of logic. Uh, we have to you know, fetch some data. We have to transform it. We have to do some like display string transformation. You can sort in different orders. You can favor it. Um, but the great thing is this just works on both iOS and Android, which is a big, another big win as well. So this being said, where have we needed to write native code? Well, we have written some native code um, around view visibility tracking. So uh, for analytics purposes, we want to know in our feed uh, how far has the user scrolled through the feed, for example. And so we ended up writing some custom code uh, on the native side to essentially track when different elements become visible in the scroll view, in the, in the view plane. Another area is that as an app, we have to integrate quite a few different uh, native ad SDKs. And some of these SDKs we had already used in our native app and we had contracts for. So we couldn't drop support for different uh, ad SDKs. But the great thing about React Native is that for any of these SDKs, if a, if a, a kind of open source wrapper or the, uh, the vendor themselves hadn't implemented uh, a React Native wrapper, we can just wrap them ourselves, which again is great. Um, so there's, we have ads uh, both in, say, articles and then on videos. You can sometimes have in our live stream, we have uh, pre-roll ads, pre ads which can occur during the live stream as well. And we, ha we ended up having to do some of this stuff natively. Um, we also have a Today View widget, which is essentially a widget on the lock screen on iOS. And uh, back from the original native app, this was a native uh, written natively. We tried to do it um, with React Native, but essentially we ran into some memory issues where the OS was just killing our widget. So we didn't end up manage managing to get to the bottom of that, so we kind of shelved that for the time being. But it definitely seems that for React Native, memory const uh, constrained situations can be a problem. Uh, and then we have some other stuff with uh, push notifications and deep link hand handling uh, and scroll view syncing as well that we ended up doing natively. So navigation, which is everyone's favorite topic. Um, so navigation is difficult. And I think it's fundamentally difficult because uh, from a React Native perspective, there's a lot going on there. I say this from the perspective of creating navigation libraries. And so essentially, uh, it's taken a while for uh, navigation libraries themselves to mature. Um, so just in the time we've built our app, there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of flux in, in, in the navigation space. So just off the top of my head, you had the original iOS navigator in React Native. You then had navigation experimental, which you could then use yourself. And then, then other libraries maybe would wrap that. Uh, then we had React Native Root of Flux, and then React Navigation came along, and then uh, React Navigation uh, released a few more versions, thanks to the guys at Expo. Um, and then React Native Root of Flux decided that in the version, whatever it is, the latest version, it's now going to use React Navigation underneath the, the hood. <laughs> so it's overall, it's just, uh, it's a bit chaotic. Um, but we went with React Navigation, and it has served us pretty well. Um, but some issues we have had um, historically is that uh, the, the tab view that shipped with React Navigation or React Native tab view, we had some issues around memory, uh, memory usage. And one of those issues came from uh, essentially you can choose with the navigator if, uh, tab navigator if you want to load these all at initial render time, so load every tab in the view hierarchy, or you can lazy load them. And the problem we had was that we have a lot of like, images and media in the different tabs, and that if we just essentially let React Native just keep all of these views in the view hierarchy, uh, essentially would just completely it, kill, the, kill the memory on the device. So we had like, out of memory exceptions uh, when we were testing locally and stuff like that. So what we had to do is essentially say, every time you change tab, make sure you unload the, the tab that's off the screen. But that's just uh, something to think about and may not actually be uh, something you need to worry about anymore. Um, for example, React Native screens can optimize this from a native perspective. Um, 
but it's only really, uh, I believe, I mean, React Native Screens was, has only been out for a few months. And so historically, this has been a problem, hopefully solved, but it's taken a, it's taken a bit of time to, to, to get there until we can kind of achieve native uh, parity with native apps. Uh, another kind of smaller limitation is uh, with React Navigation, you have to define your routes up front, um, which can be slightly limiting because in the, uh, from the perspective of an article, uh, we can push an article onto a stack in our app so it, you, know, you can swipe back to go back to the feed. But say if I want to push an article from a different stack, like say when I open the menu, I, I have a saved article screen and I want to, to push them, uh, push articles there and then swipe back to get to my list of articles. Well, that can actually be a bit problematic because from the article screen, we can reach many other screens, so related tickers or whatever it is. Um, and so if you create an alternate route for your article page, then you essentially have to uh, redefine every other reachable screen from that screen. So it's a bit problematic. Um, not that you can't get around it, but it can be a bit, uh, a bit troublesome. And so one last issue that has been a problem is that, uh, and more of a consistent problem uh, with older Android devices, is that deep view hier hierarchies have been, uh, been a problem. Um, and by that, uh, you can essentially exceed the stack size limit on some older Android phones with the depth of your view hierarchy. And um, essentially, setting up your React Navigation app can contribute to that uh, just with how navigators are composable. Some views can uh, just be at the top of your view hierarchy, um, which can be a problem. Um, but maybe less so now, uh, because I don't, for example, we don't support Android 4 anymore. But it hasn't been an issue past that point. But it's just something to think about if you have those constraints with uh, lower end Android phones. So, another favorite topic Redux. <coughs> and uh, essentially, what we found um, is that as you write an app which kind of grows organically over a period of time, uh, for one, so we use Redux in our app, um, but uh, we've essentially found that the, I guess the bigger your app gets, the more you can suffer from potential Redux issues. Um, so Redux is good from ensuring an application uh, correctness uh, perspective. So it does help single piece of state, does help you write less bugs. but. Uh, essentially, it, it seems to me like having a single event emitter where everything is subscribed to can be a problem. And an anecdotal example is if I do something like I push an article onto my, onto my screen. Um, when the article loads, uh, or rather the component loads, it fires off some, uh, some requests. So it fires off some Redux actions. It goes, fetch me some data. OK, data loaded, whatever. Um, but it just so happens that while your newsfeed is below your article in the stack, your newsfeed could be re-rendering every single time you fire off any action. And you can fix that, of course. But essentially, I, I believe these issues stem from uh, essentially like bad defaults. So yes, you can fix them, but it's kind of you have to stay on top of it that you're not consistently hammering the performance of your application, which may look good on iOS, but on Android, you're doing a ton of unnecessary work, and it can really slow your application down. Um, and another example is that if you decide to put, um, if you decide to put uh, React Navigation uh, state within your Redux store, uh, if you dispatch an action which updates your state, which then causes some animations to happen, um, I should say that this isn't recommended by the navigation team anymore, but this is something we still do because we haven't migrated away from it. But just an example, if I say tap on something and it dispatches a navigate action, and then that action goes through uh, the kind of uh, the Redux life cycles of updating uh, different stores, running through middleware, there can be a lot of stuff which is actually executed before that before the uh, the navigators get updated with their given props to know that they need to start an animation. So again, like Redux could hammer um, your performance in that perspective, from that perspective. 
Also, another thing that can be difficult is list performance. So it can be hard to get uh, lists to feel really snappy on Android. And, um, and then there can be multiple reasons for this. Uh, one of them can be that creating views, as you see in these rows here, that um, there's actually quite a lot of views in, in each row. And it can be that mounting these, these, uh, these views themselves is pretty expensive. Um, and if you have to do that, uh, you know, every time you scroll, you're mounting more. Uh, with native lists, say UI table view, for example, um, you can recycle these views. So you mount them once, and you can make things fast by just updating the data. Um, but for example, Flatlist doesn't do this. Um, and I believe that uh, there are some JavaScript impl implementations which do try and do this. But um, I think they do, they do suffer from the asynchronicity of React Native being slow and this being an issue with how, how, how well you can optimize. Um, there can also be other issues like not knowing the height of your row can be a, a, be a problem. Um, in this case, we do know how high every row is, but we may have some content, some variable size content within the actual, um, the uh, within this table itself. So we sometimes inject uh, uh, some, like a, an ad in, in, in further down in the feed, um, but you don't know whether the ad's loaded. Uh, if it does load, it can be variable different sizes. Um, and so these kind of issues can, can have at least stopped us from optimizing in that way. It may be possible to work around it, but um, again, it can be an issue, um, which may not be the case if you're using native list, for example. Um, and another thing to, to note is that, from at least from what I've seen from my own observations, we've not really suffered from any performance issues on the iOS side at all, like with lists um, such as these ones. But they have been a problem on, on Android con uh, more consistently. Um, but on iOS, it's not really ever been an issue. So it's just something to keep in mind, I think, that when you do develop, um, if you do care about your Android audience and, say, reaching uh, different markets, it's definitely something you should be wary of that it may be good to start developing on Android uh, and use that as the benchmark. Um, because you could be layering abstractions upon abstractions of things which could be harming your performance. For example, you could be using style components which has a less, uh, takes longer to mount than the style sheet, uh, or just a standard React Native component. But maybe you don't know that until you've built this all out. Um, but you, you would have known had you started on Android. So just an example of where lists can be a problem and you cannot realize until you run this on Android, this is one of those such problems. So, um, so this is a flame graph for anyone that doesn't know. And you can actually get this by uh, recording in the performance tab within Chrome. And so what we're actually seeing here is that you can see uh, that X is on, uh, sorry, uh, time is on the X axis and basically cool stack depth is on the, is on the Y. Um, and what's happening here is that, say I want to render 50 rows in batches of uh, five at a time or whatever. This is a fairly contrived example. But um, if I wanted to do that, um, if I rendered all 50 at once, the, uh, the JavaScript thread might be completely locked, or say 100. It would be locked, so you couldn't interact during that time. So uh, by default, Flatlist has some uh, max number per batch prop or something like that. And so you can say to Flatlist, OK, only render in batches of 10. And that means that the thread sort of unlocks every 10 frames to respond to, to, to events. But essentially, what's happening here is that every batch of 10 is growing in width. So it's taking longer and more and more time uh, every time. And so turns out you can fix this and make it like that. And so this is roughly to scale. So uh, it was roughly about taking half the time there or thereabouts. And how do you fix this? Well, it's as simple as doing something like this. But it may not, you may not realize until you actually take a, a deep dive and, and, and actually go and look at optimizing some of this stuff. So what's happening here is that I at least found this tendency within, uh, from looking at code uh, within our code base, that 
uh, quite often with a list, it, it, you, you're given a render row or render item uh, prop that you pass a function into. And um, it can be quite tempting just to say, OK, this function, I'm going to write some code out. I'm going to have a fairly large uh, function that's doing, doing work. But unless you give React the opportunity to optimize with should component update, it may essentially do a lot of unnecessary re-rendering, even though it doesn't have to. And so what we've got here is that we can define a component, say, called row wrapper, pass in the data as a, a, a pure object, if you will. And then from that data itself, you can do the should component update optimizations. Um, and yeah, as you can see, this makes a big difference. But again, maybe not something you noticed on iOS, but when you take a look at Android, why it's slow, you're like, oh, OK, so this is actually what's going on. And it can make a big difference to how your application performs. So for the future and beyond, um, I think that as a team, uh, we've been really positive um, about, as engineers, and our product owners have been really positive around the speed at which we can ship things. Um, and uh, I personally believe that, uh, that React Native is the best cross-platform cross framework that has been uh, and is currently. Um, and the main reason I believe this is that there is always an escape hatch with React Native. Um, so, so for example, I gave, I gave you this example of this list. If you're like, wow, this list is really, really killing us right now, um, what can we do to better optimize it? Um, well, if you could go no further in React Native, you could just stick a, a native list view in there if you want to do and do the whole thing natively. You're never completely locked in. Um, and another thing that I do feel is important also is to, is to one, use the platform. So I think, for example, Christoph earlier on talked, to, talked about um, so using the platform for animations using the platform for optimizations around um, the different view controllers, frag, uh, view controllers on iOS and fragments on Android. If you use the platform for those navigation components, you then get all of the, um, all of the optimizations that come from it. So removing views from the view hierarchy when they're not visible, that kind of thing. And that we as a, as a, like as a community or as a framework, we should be trying to use um, the, the tools that we already that have been in native apps since the uh, since their beginning, I guess in the framework since the beginning, um, and um, I'm really hoping that Fabric and synchronous rendering and JSI and stuff like that, which are all uh, Facebook are working on currently, that should help integration with native components a bit. So synchronous rendering could actually be really good for list views. Uh, you could use a stock list view that comes with the platform. And uh, the, one of the reasons why this would be, uh, be easier than it currently is, because some people have tried, is uh, with synchronous rendering, you can render views on the main thread. And that's what you need to be able to do to use some of these, um, these platform components. And it would make things better for navigation. Uh, you could share state between, um, between JavaScript and native and have one source of truth, which both sides can introspect. And they can send messages to each other, not across a bridge, but with just pure function invocations. So uh, I'm really excited for the future. Um, and I'm kind of looking forward to, uh, to what we can do with some of the new architectural stuff coming up, and what we can do to, to, to close the gap between, uh, to close the gap between uh, React Native and Native. So the, some of the things I want, I want great, uh, great list views, that'd be great. Um, and uh, just, I guess, better integration with the platform with maybe synchronous rendering. Uh, this could help. Uh, navigation components, everything, uh, other things like that. So I guess the question is, how can we as a community and as developers uh, make the framework even better? Um, and that I pose that question to you now. Um, and that's, that's my piece. Uh, thank you. We are hiring. So Bloomberg are hiring for a React Native engineer, uh, at, least, at least one in New York. Um, 
And we're also hiring for, in London, for, for other positions, JavaScript positions, back-end positions, that kind of thing. Um, if anyone wants to talk to me in person, feel free to email me, uh, contact me on Twitter, at uh, Josh J. Hargreaves, um, and or just grab me in person. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's been great to, to be here, and I look forward to speaking to some of you later on.